Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started? Good afternoon um, and welcome to one of, of MDTC's um, monthly webinars, virtual events sponsored by um, MDTC's Young Lawyers Association or Young Lawyers Section. Um, I'm really glad to um, welcome you all. This is gonna be a really cool um, presentation. And in just a minute, I'm gonna introduce um, the presenter, Randy Yipe. Um, but first, I just wanted to, and the slide shows you the specific dates of events we have coming up for the MDTC. Um, our Legal Excellence Awards event is March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, at the Jam Theater, in which the MDTC will be honoring um, judges, attorneys, um, opposing counsel, a wide variety of people, and we also get to eat and drink. So it's an event you should not just save the date, you should go ahead and register and get your tickets. Um, another date you should save is our summer meeting, which is June 17th, 16th and 17th in Gaylord at Treetops Resort. Um, uh, a one and a half day seminar full of all sorts of useful information. Um, please put that on your cal calendar and we hope to see you there. Um, and then finally, um, this event is sponsored by our Young Lawyers section. Um, young Lawyers, um, our attorneys have been practicing less than five years. If you're not a member and that criteria fits you, please consider joining. Um, otherwise, join the MDTC as a regular lawyer. Um, that way you get to see this seminar and other webinars, um, upcoming webinars for free. So now I want to introduce Randy Yipe to you, who's going to talk about um, being an associate in a law firm. I met Randy, who's a partner now with Foley Barnes, uh, Metzger and Yai. I, I don't know, Randy, a long time ago, years ago, yeah. <laughs> years ago, as opposing counsel, he was doing plaintiff's work back then. And he was aggressive, a formidable opponent. Um, very happy now that he is doing defense work. Um, and he was an associate back then, now a partner. So he clearly will have words of wisdom for you, um, which will be delivered with his trademark offbeat humor. And I have to tell you that if I had known, Randy, that you would list Green Lantern comics as one of your great reads back then, our relationship would have been so much smoother on opposite sides of the V. So here's Randy for you. I'm sure you will be educated and entertained. Uh, all right, Deborah, thank you so much. Um, I, I really do appreciate it. I'm a huge fan of the Green Lantern, as anybody who knows me knows. It's, it's uh, willpower is the greatest uh, power in the universe. Oh, That's yeah. No, me too. Me too. Absolutely. That jumped right out at me. Um, all right. So so I want to talk about how to be an all-star associate in, in your firm. Uh, and at the end, you'll you'll get that little tagline advice you, you could have gotten from The Rock or A Rock. But but here's here's the piece. I, th I think, uh, well, first off, introductions. Deborah already did a good job, so I'm not going to speak over. I I'm Randy Yipe. Uh, Foley, Baron, Metzger, and Yipe is my firm. Yes, Yipe rhymes with Skype. It's the traditional pronunciation uh, for those of you who don't know. Um, I I'm a trial lawyer, uh, which means essentially I will tell stories for money. I think that's a lot of what all of us do. And that's kind of the art that we want to get at is, is marrying the, the practice of law with the art of law. Personally, I like watching TV. My wife and I just finished watching the fourth season of Ozark, which is pretty good. Anybody who hasn't seen it probably should watch it. It's a good show, interesting stuff. I have five uh, adorable children. They're young, right? In this picture, they grow up, they get unruly, just in case any of you are planning or looking forward to that. They go from being cute and adorable and docile and pliant to, to being old. Um, I believe that every time you attend a conference or every time you, you attend a session of anything, you should walk with one piece of, of useful information. And so at the risk of the assumption that the rest of this presentation is not going to provide you with any useful information, I offer you this, the swine apple, uh, which is rib meat, pork rib meat, which is you know rubbed with spices, uh, surrounded with pineapple, coated with bacon and barbecue sauce, smoked uh, at 240, maybe 225 uh, for a minimum of five hours. That's the swine apple. Why is it good? It's the it's the complex um, molecule bromelain, uh, which is naturally found in pineapple. It's a meat tenderizer. 
It is delicious. It is porky. It's pineapple, but not too pineapple. It's bacony. Those of you uh, who know me also know that I don't like pineapple on pizza. This is an acceptable way to eat pineapple. So boom, the more you know, now you can say when someone asks, hey, what did you learn when you listen to Yike talk for 45 minutes or an hour? You can say, well, I learned about the swineapple and it looks delicious. So let's talk about the problem that we have. This is a problem that I perceive. I don't know that I, this is universal in the world. I do think we have a problem though. And I, I think it's that we used to do things in the law that we no longer do. We, we used to um, train lawyers differently. We used to do a whole lot of things differently. For, and I don't mean this to be a grandpa Simpson, like I tied an onion around my belt, you know, and, and two nickels was a, a farthing, whatever it was. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to reminisce. I don't want to sound like an old lawyer because to be quite frank, I don't think I am. But, but I'll say this. Oh, I don't mean for this to be a millennial versus boomer thing either. And the reason mostly is as entertaining as I find that I'm a generation Xer, which just means we're kind of existing in the middle of all this kind of holding everything together. Here's the thing, though. We used to read the law. And by we, I mean our profession, because none of us on this call actually read the law. Reading the law is a thing that happens, I think, to Kardashians in Florida. Uh, and to lawyers that practiced in the in the 1800s, um, where you would go and you would learn, you'd mentor under a, a, a seasoned lawyer, someone who knew the law, and you'd watch and you'd observe, and you'd hear stories, and you'd learn how to practice law experientially, which is very different than how we learn to practice law now. We go to law school for three years. We learn a lot about how to take the bar exam, but we learn very little about how to actually practice law. I'll, I'll offer this. Uh, again, this is a lot of opinion on my part. Most of what we do as lawyers didn't come from law school. It came from watching other lawyers practice in court, being mentored by our bosses at our firms, things along those lines. So, so reading the law is a thing that we used to do, but we don't do it anymore. So what do we substitute? Well, we used to have all sorts of things that would substitute for that. We used to have motion call. And I, I, I've told a lot of you, I, every Monday I was in Macomb as a young lawyer, every Wednesday I was in Oakland, every Friday I was in Wayne. I'd have a stack of motions. You'd go and you'd argue your motions. And that was that was what you'd do. That's how you would, you would learn the law. That's how you'd figure some things out. Um, you used to get to watch great lawyers argue good cases. More importantly, you got to watch bad lawyers argue bad cases. I learn, and I know to this day uh, that if you don't uh, attach a contract to a complaint alleging breach of contract, your case can get dismissed. That's a thing that I probably should have learned in law school, but I actually learned at motion call watching a lawyer have his case dismissed. So that's a thing that we really don't have anymore. Now we have motions, not as frequently as we used to. We have motion call, but it's usually via Zoom. You show up and you argue for 15 minutes. You don't get to sit in a packed courtroom. You don't get to not, you know, I guess, I guess we didn't have cell phones back then. We're, uh, we weren't allowed to have newspapers either. So you, you had to sit and watch. You had to learn. That's how you learn the art of ad advocacy. Um, we used to actually have phone calls. This is controversial. I, I think some people still use the phone, but I think a lot of us now avoid the phone, which is a little bit weird. Um, it used to be very common to pick up a phone and to call opposing counsel, to work things out, uh, to say, hey, look, I, I got to file a motion. Um, on, on these interrogatories that face it, nobody's ever really going to read, but we seem to want them anyway. Uh, I, I, that used to be a thing. We used to call and work out disputes. We used to actually call and talk about the disputes that we would have. Uh, that doesn't happen any longer. I think that's because people don't like being on the phone. I think people like texting. It's certainly more convenient, it's certainly easier to drop an email, but those relationships that were formed on the phone, those, those mattered. We used to have regular trials. The first year I was a lawyer, I think we tried 14 cases. I sat as second chair for most of those. The second year, it was 13. It, it's trailed off since then. Very few of us have actually tried any cases in the last two years for, for obvious reasons. But even before COVID, uh, trials were, were, were waning down. And that was a great way of learning things. I've, I've told the story before. I, I learned the rules of evidence in law school, but I never really actually understood the, rule of, the rules of evidence until I saw them at a trial. And then everything starts to click. So we used to have trials. We used to travel for depositions. Uh, and some of us still do, but I guarantee you not as frequently as we used to. I, I think lawyers in my firm, we used to be gone two, three, four, five times a month traveling to places. Now, you got nice frequent flyer miles. You got to stay at a mediocre hotel, maybe have a decent meal. But here's the thing. Lots of relationship building occurs on those deposition trips, or it used to. So we used to hang out with other co-defense attorneys. We used to hang out with plaintiff attorneys. Um, 
those kind of personal relationships are important. You get to know their life. They get to know your life. It humanizes the practice of law. And now we don't have that. We show up on a Zoom for a deposition, which is fine. We're saving our clients lots of money. We're being much more efficient. We can handle more cases. But it's the relationships that are suffering. And then we used to have office-based work. I don't know uh, everybody on the call. I'm not sure what your return to office status is, but I know for a fact that many of us have been working remotely for a number of years, and probably that's going to continue into the future. And we used to have a, a sense of duty to the profession. And I don't mean to suggest by listing that here that we don't have a sense of duty to the profession, but obviously you want to be responsible to your law firm and to your clients, but you also want to be responsible to the bar itself. We have ethical duties um, that many of you remember swearing into when you got signed in, or not signed in, but sworn into the practice of law, to uphold the practice, to teach, to, to, to profess, to, to be honorable in this profession. And that comes from all of the things above it, learning, uh, relationship building, things along those lines. And then, you know, we, we got this virus that's kind of flying around. Um, and I, th I think a lot of this has changed. I think a lot of it's not coming back. I, I think a lot of us... Uh, who had the busy motion calls, remember them fondly, but we also remember them not fondly. Motion call used to be a, a three, four hour proposition, which was expensive to clients and taxing on your schedule. Now it's a 15, 20 minute proposition at best. So I think for a lot of reasons, good and bad, this is this is not changing. So so what what do we do now? How does this work now? And how are we gonna how are we gonna confront this? So so here I am. I'm gonna give you a little talk about how to be an all star associate uh, in your firm. Um, and how to how to advance your career and how to how to better serve your clients because that is at the heart of everything. We became lawyers not to make ourselves better, but to make the lives of our clients easier, to take away their problems, to solve their issues. That's that's the beauty of this bespoke, rich attorney-client relationship. And we need to remember that in everything that we do because if we keep that at the center of our thinking, the, the reality that some of these some of these folks are coming to us in their darkest times. And this, this is actually something applies to plaintiffs as well as defendants. If your client is getting sued, it's, it's a bad time professionally for them. It's a bad time personally for them. And so they come to you for advice. They come to you for guidance. They come to you for all this stuff. No matter where you are in the pecking order on your firm, those are your responsibilities. So becoming an all-star associate is going to do a whole bunch of things. It's going to help you be a better lawyer. It's going to help your firm be a better firm. It's going to help all of you help your clients more. And that's what we really want to get at. Uh, okay, a couple of, you know, quid pro quos and provisos. Uh, thank you, uh, Robin Williams, Aladdin. Um, I am not all knowing. Uh, if anybody from my firm is watching this, disregard that because I totally am. Um, but I am not all knowing. I think I know a lot and I think I have a lot of opinions, but I don't know everything. Piece number two, I am not your boss. Again, if you're from my firm, you can disregard it because I kind of am. But if you're not from my firm, uh, I'm not your boss. So I'm not going to tell you how to practice law. I'm not going to tell you how to do things. You need to listen to what your boss says and what your, your, what your superiors have to say. Um, but I think a lot of this, I think a lot of this stuff is going to be uh, applicable across firms. Number three, I'm still learning. Um, learning should be a lifelong proposition, I think. I, I think there's a lot of stuff in here that I have picked up over time. I hope in the next uh, part of my career, I'm going to learn even more about this. So so let's, let's talk about this stuff. And I, I've broken this into a couple of chunks. Uh, so just generally speaking, how to be an all-star associate. Let's get into this. Uh, first off, let's think about our clients. I just gave you a little, a little um, ham sandwich about clients and why clients are important. Clients are important for, for two reasons. Number one, they're the lifeblood of what we do. If it weren't for clients, uh, maybe our lives would be a little bit easier and less complex. Uh, but if it weren't for clients, we wouldn't have jobs. We chose to be attorneys. We chose to pursue this, this rich beautiful profession to help these people that come to us in their greatest hour of need. Clients are the reason we do this. Now, here's, here's the secret. Clients are also, they're how we get paid, right? If we didn't, if we didn't do work for clients, we don't bill hours. We don't get revenue. That's, that's, that's the cycle of this. So clients are really important for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, but I'll offer you this. A lot of lawyers think of clients as a game of hungry, hungry hippos, where you got a bunch of lawyers and they're all kind of competing for the same the same juicy little red balls of clients as you see there in the middle. That's not exactly how it is, but let's assume that that's the way it is. I don't know that it's a zero sum game. I, I really don't. I, I believe that 
um, even within a firm or within a within a, a, a section of the law, like like professional defense or the trial, Michigan Defense Trial Council, as we are, I don't know that it's it's a it's a zero sum game. I think that there are enough clients out there for, for everybody, but I want you to think a little bit differently about how we define client, right? There are obviously clients of your firm, some long term, some short term. <clears throat> They're the ones that everybody primarily thinks about when we think about lawyers, right? And having clients, you, you have a corporation Y or hospital Z or Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so they're hiring your firm. They're coming to your firm with a problem, with an issue, with something they need help with. Uh, you're going to provide legal services that are of value to them. You're going to send them a bill. They're going to pay it. Everybody is happy in the end, right? Those that's the most traditional view of clients. Here's a different way of thinking about it. You have clients of your firm, but you also have clients in your firm, especially as an associate of the firm. And who are they? Well, your clients um, are, are all of the above. So any client exists because they want their life made easier. And any, any lawyer who just fulfills their expectations and moves on, they're probably going to be all right in the long run. But if you make your client's life easier, you'll, you're fulfilling one of, the, one of the big responsibilities of being a lawyer, right? So think about your bosses. Think about your superiors as your clients, those for whom you want to provide valued services, those who you want to make their life easier, those who, who come to you with a need that you can then fulfill. And then everybody's happy, right? So I, I really encourage all the associates that are listening, um, younger, middle range, older, whatever it might be, think of the folks that are in your firm as clients, those who assign you work, those who you work with your colleagues, Think of the folks outside of your firm as clients as well. Have that same client service mentality available. And I think, I think you'll do very, very well for yourself. And you'll, cer you'll certainly do well for your clients as, as defined. There's a back and forth relationship, right? You take care of them, they take care of you. That applies to both sets of clients, right? The clients that are in your firm, you take care of them, you give them good work, they will take care of you. They, they'll build you up, they'll help you build your reputation, they'll train you, they'll teach you. It also applies to the clients outside of your firm. Remember, people come to lawyers not because they want to hang out with lawyers, even though, let's face it, we're all awesome and very clever and very cool. People come to lawyers because they have problems that need solving. They have issues that need resolution. When you take care of those issues, when you take care of those problems, you've now made not just a friend, but, but, but a, a long-term, long-road uh, client, essentially. And that's, that's how this works. I'll say this, another tip, own it. If you're working on a file, even if you're just popping in to write a motion, if you're popping in to summarize a record, if you're popping in to argue motion, whatever it might be, that becomes your file. You should own it. Even if it's not your origination, even if the client didn't assign it to you, you should work that file like it's your file, like it's the most important file that you have. Because once you have that ownership of it, it becomes yours and you become an expert on the file. You become the go-to person. That has to do with initiative. I think whenever a, a young lawyer asks me, what's the number one quality that you're looking for when you hire? What's the number one quality you look for for promotion and for salary and for bonus and for all that stuff? It comes down to this word, initiative. Those You can be very successful as a lawyer, believe you me, if you sit and have work assigned to you and you complete the work in a, in a very workmanlike fashion, you fulfill expectations, you give the work back, you wait for the next assignment. That's a, that's a valuable piece. Absolutely. There's no question about that. Law firms need all types. But if you really want to be an all-star associate in your organization, in your firm, to your clients, both inside and outside of the firm, that word right there, initiative, is what matters. Not just to passively receive work, but to take that work to fulfill it, to fulfill expectations, to do it well, but then to return that work with a list of things, perhaps. So for example, um, you're asked to do a medical record summary. You go through, nobody likes medical record summaries. Well, there's two or three people that they're weird. That's okay though, right? I'm not, not calling names. I'm just saying like, oh man, medical record summaries. Here's the thing. You do that medical record summary. You could, you could do it with A plus effort Turn that back in. You have fulfilled expectations. Okay, I'm ready for the next thing. That's, that's all right. That's not all-star work, though. You do that same piece. You give A-plus work. You give A-plus effort. But now you also write a brief memo to the assigning attorney saying, hey, in this medical record, I saw the following three things that, are, that should be important to the file. 
you know, maybe there's a nurse that, that doesn't quite jive with what the vitals are. Maybe there's a doctor who wrote an offhanded note. Maybe there's something that seems missing. When you have the initiative to take one project and turn it into multiple projects, you're driving the file forward. You're doing the work that your clients have hired you to do. It's really, really important because you've also made your in-firm client's life easier. I'll say that again. You've made your in-firm client's life easier. The attorney that assigned you that work gave you that medical record to summarize, gave you that motion to write, gave you that deposition to summarize, whatever it might be, with the expectation that they would get back a good medical record summary, a decent motion, a deposition summary they could send on. That's fine. You fulfill that expectation. Check mark. Now you give that back to them with a list of to do's. Hey, what about this? Should we look into this? Can I do this? For example, take that initiative and say, I think we should meet with Dr. So-and-so and ask her why she wrote this. That's a beautiful thing because that helps drive the file forward. You make their life a little bit easier. Now, chances are, since you've become the expert, since you own that file, chances are you're going to get to go do that meeting or at least sit in on that meeting, perhaps. Chances are you could ask to sit on that meeting. That's the way this works. You help them, they help you. The file moves forward. The client is happy. Everyone is thrilled. Initiative is a big, big deal. I also think that as defense attorneys, we tend to be reactive rather than proactive. I think it's easy to sit back because the plaintiff, remember, the plaintiff has a burden of proof. They're the ones that have to drive the file forward. They're the ones that have to um, prove all the elements of their case beyond a, a, a reasonable degree of probability. They're the ones that have to drive the case forward. If nothing happens, the case gets dismissed, right? If they produce no evidence and they produce no witnesses, that's, that's a chip shot of a summary disposition motion. So it's easy for defense attorneys to be reactive to things, to wait for the request to come in, so on and so forth. If you want to be an all-star associate and, and serve clients both in your firm and outside of your firm, a really smart thing to do is to be more proactive, to suggest moves. You know, stop playing checkers and start playing chess, essentially. Think three or four moves ahead. We're going to need a qualified protective order to have HIPAA compliant meetings with some of these physicians that are, that are in the medical records. We should do that right now. So all that hassle is out of the way so that when it comes time, we can do that. We should think about causation witnesses. We should think about damages witnesses. We should think about medical records that we might want to order and might not want to order. Offering those proactive tips to whoever's assigning you that work makes you immensely valuable. Because again, if you're given a job and you do the job, it's fine. That's acceptable. That fulfills expectations. But if you take that job and do the job, and then you offer additional next steps, some ideas, you're, you're actively participating in the file. By being proactive like that, you're driving the file forward. You're making the person who assigned that work, you're making their life easier. You're making them look good to your joint clients, to their client to what is becoming your client now, you're making the firm look good. That is the secret as to how to move these things forward. All right, let's talk about in the courtroom because I think many of us wanted to become lawyers to, to go into the courtroom, to argue motions, to argue trials, to do those kind of things. So let's talk about how we can can fulfill those responsibilities in the courtroom. And I should I should offer this. I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to save some time for questions and answers at the end. Um, if you know me in presentations, you know that I'm going to rattle on right to the stroke of 1 p.m., but I'm going to do my best, my absolute best to work as hard as I can uh, to save some time. So if you guys have questions, save them. We can chat about them in the chat. We can answer them actually uh, for real. Uh, if I do run to one o'clock, you can call me after whatever that might be. So let's talk about in the courtroom because in the courtroom is how we traditionally think about advocacy, right? Number one tip in the courtroom, watch and learn. There are some really, 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 really good lawyers out there that are practicing law that you can learn from. And I guarantee it, if you are more attentive, and I, again, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm Grandpa Simpson, if you're in court and you have a chance to watch other lawyers, even if you're on a Zoom, you have a chance to watch other lawyers, put that second screen away, put that phone down, watch, see what they do. See how the judge responds to it. See how opposing counsel responds to it. You're in a trial and you're sitting second chair. One of the most important jobs you're going to have is to watch that jury, to see who's responding to what arguments, who doesn't like what arguments, who doesn't like what attorneys. That kind of intelligence is absolutely invaluable. And if you become the master of that, if you own that kind of information, hey, 
you know, partner so-and-so. Juror number four hates the plaintiff attorney. Juror number three doesn't like it when we object, whatever that might be. That's information that can be artfully turned and twisted and used. Not twisted, that's kind of the wrong word, but you know what I mean. That can be used in a closing argument to your client's benefit. So when you're in court, watch, learn. There's huge things that you can know. Like, like I gave the example earlier about motion call. That's where I learned a lot of the art of oral advocacy is watching dozens, scores, hundreds of lawyers argue well and argue poorly. And you can learn just as much from watching great lawyers as you can from watching bad lawyers. And I still do it. Yes, always. Severus. Um, I, so I Googled, I, a lot of this is really schlocky stock imagery, but I Googled like, what does a good lawyer look like? And this image came up. I don't know who that dude is with the sunglasses, but I would watch him in court. I mean, a guy that just kind of shows up to his firm photo on a rooftop somewhere wearing sunglasses, like beach hair, don't care. That's a dude I would watch because it's either going to be really good or it's going to be really bad. There's no middle ground with that guy. Now, to be quite frank, uh, I'm fascinated by other humans. I'd also watch Mr. Had a Bad Breakfast Burrito. I don't know what he's going to do, but it's going to be it's going to be interesting. Um, all right. Know your judge. When someone comes to me in my firm with a problem, hey, what do you think about this motion? You know, what do you think about this? My, my very first question is, who's your judge? And I, I want to tell you that it shouldn't matter, that justice is blind, uh, that all judges are equally impressive and brilliant. Uh, we have an ethical duty in our Michigan rules of professional conduct of respect to the tribunal. So I will not tell you that there are good judges and there are bad judges, but who your judge is matters. And who your judge is should matter to how you present their case, your case rather. There, there, are, there are judges that will listen to um, minute detail and pick a unit argument and will read literature and will walk through it with you in a Daubert hearing. There are judges that couldn't possibly care less about your written motion, probably haven't even read it. It is critically important to know who your judge is and how they want to receive the evidence, how they want to receive the argument. Because if you're not presenting to your audience, be it a jury, be it your client, be it a judge, you're not really engaging in the art of effective trial advocacy. So know your judge. And that involves a little bit of observation, watching and learning, right? It also involves asking around, keeping some notes, seeing how, who judge, what judges do what, or asking the question yourself. When some lawyer comes back and says, oh, I just argued a motion and this judge threw in uh, you know, a fifth um, requirement for this HIPAA qualified protective order. Which judge was that? Anybody else have orders from that judge? You know, things along those lines. Know your judge. Know your audience by definition. All right, be prepared. Another Disney callback right there. Be prepared. It's a, it's a great tip. As a young lawyer, as an associate, it is your job to be prepared, to be the one that has done the reading, to be the one that knows that file cold. Know the rules. Cold, right? My, my first boss... Um, used to say that the best thing you could do for yourself every year was to read the, the, civil, the rules of civil procedures, the Michigan court rules, and the rules of evidence from cover to cover once a year. And his challenge was, hey, look, like you're going to find something you never found before. You're going to read something you'd never read before. And sure enough, you do. Read those rules. Know those rules. This is, this is the, the, the currency of our profession is to know the rules, right? You also want to know the, the case law. Whatever, whatever industry you're in, if you're in construction, you're in auto neg, you're in med mail, whatever it might be, know your case law. Talk about it with the other lawyers in your firm. It is so important that if you're going to declare yourself to be a specialist in some segment of the law, like med mail, auto neg, whatever it might be, you got to know your case law. You have to be, as a young lawyer, as an associate, you should be the most well-informed on this because you're going to be an asset then to the folks that, that, that the in-firm partners and the out-of-firm partners. So when you show up to court, this should have been animated. I apologize. You should know the facts better than anybody else. You should know the law better than anybody else. If you're going on a motion to compel, you should have two or three cases that support your piece. Even though everybody knows you get 28 days on interrogatories, it's always good to have that case in the back of your head. There are cases that are seminal cases in your area of the law. Um, everybody in my firm knows my love for Bottle of Mente versus William Beaumont Hospital. That's a case that we quote over and over and over again because it has so many different things. You should know the law better than anybody else. If you are attending court and sitting second chair on a motion, on a trial, whatever it might be, you need to be ready with those documents. 
right? So when your partner is arguing uh, a motion, when your partner is cross-examining uh, a, a key expert witness, you should have all those documents laid out and, and have your hand on them, ready to offer them at a second's notice. That kind of coordination, again, is invaluable. It goes from fulfilling an expectation of, oh yeah, I know where the thing is, and then you got to turn around, you got to, to to being a, a true all star, to being someone who's who's always prepared, always ready. Practice to argue, even if you're not going to be the one arguing. And, and here's the reason: number one, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna pick up the next piece. You're gonna pick up the pinch points of your argument, the things that are the weaker parts of your argument, the problems you have with your case, and you can be proactive in solving those problems in looking for the evidence that solves those problems and looking for the witnesses that solve those problems. I think the bigger thing is, even if you're not going to argue, you should prepare. You should prepare to argue that motion. You should be prepared to take that deposition. You should be prepared to take that witness, to do the opening statement, to do the closing argument for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's going to hone your skills, right? We do better when we practice, we do better when we try something and then edit it a little bit and move on. And that's part of the tragedy of not having a lot of trials. Early on, I tried a ton of cases, but they were they were minuscule cases. And, and I, I, you know, I, I tried cases on the defense and I also tried plaintiff's cases because my first boss thought you should always have both. It teaches you to think in two different ways. But the beauty is when you have a chance to be bad on little issues, you can fix those mistakes and be good on the bigger issues. And that's really, really critically important, number one. Number two, when you decide, okay, this is how I'm gonna argue this motion. First, I'd say this, then I'd say this, then I'd say this. And if the judge asked me this, I'd say this, this, and this. That's your plan, that's your game plan, you've locked it in. Suppose the person who's arguing the motion uh, you know, can't do it. Now you're ready, you're ready to step up. That's an opportunity right there. You can say, hey, I'm ready, put me in. Or you can watch them argue. Theoretically, someone with years, decades of experience more than you have, see what they do differently. And then here's the piece. Ask them, hey, if I was going to argue this motion, Mrs. Partner, I would have said X, Y, and Z. And then I would have saved A, B, and C from my rebuttal. But you led with B and C. You didn't talk about A at all. Why'd you do that? They might have some really good reasons why they did that. They might not have any reason why they did that, to be quite frank. I guarantee you this, though. They will be impressed with your preparation. They'll be impressed with the effort you put into this endeavor. To think that someone who's just going to sit second chair and observe a motion, which, by the way, is a great benefit of a Zoom hearing, if there is any, that you can just kind of pop in and pop out without it being a huge expense to you or your firm. But to think that someone who's just going to watch or observe or sit second on a motion or a hearing or a witness or a trial is ready to do it, has thought through, has gone through the steps, that's a big sign of maturity. That's a big sign that they're ready to take on additional responsibility. And that's what that's what assigning lawyers are looking for, are those lawyers who want the additional responsibility and who can handle the additional responsibility in small digestible bites. So that's the really important part on, 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 on preparation. And then Picasso used to say, I love this quote, learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. For the record, I am not advocating violating the court rules or our rules of evidence. I want that to be clear. This is being recorded. So I feel like I feel like that, that, that is on the record. But you want to know the rules so you, you can know how to get that piece of evidence in. There's three or four different ways, I guarantee every time. You want to know the rules so you know which objection to make and then which objection to make secondarily and, and, and after that. You want to know the rules so you know if I request this deposition at this time, now he's or she's required to do this, then he or she will do that. That's, that's how the art and the tactic and the strategy of the law comes together. So learn those rules, the court rules, the rules of evidence, uh, all that. All right, this is a big one, uh, respect and courtesy. Um, I was going to say to opposing counsel, but I, I thought that that might be discourteous, even if it's a little funny. Um, I feel, and I think a number of other lawyers that I've spoken with, feel like there's a general decrease in the level of professionalism and civility in the practice of law. I think that comes from the fact that we don't talk anymore. We don't call each other on the phone. We don't travel together. We don't see each other's pictures of vacations, all of those things. I think respect and courtesy is huge. This is a bespoke profession. What we're doing right now, this is an important thing that we're doing. And the folks on the other side of the V, they're not our enemies. They're coworkers in this, in this 
adversarial system. And yes, I mean, they're adversaries. There's no question about that. That's the premise of the American system of justice is that everybody's entitled to a lawyer, a good lawyer who works hard, who's prepared. The plaintiff is entitled and the defendant is entitled. And, and even though our system has a ton of, of problems and inefficiencies, it is still the best system for resolving disputes between two citizens the world has ever created. It relies on that adversarial tension. It relies, however, on it being professional and courteous as well. And, and I'll, I'll offer this. I think the only thing you carry for your entire career, no matter where you go and what you do, the only thing you carry is your reputation. And if you are sneaky, if you are not a person of their word, if you become known as someone who is um, unreliable, who is shifty, that reputation will stick with you for years and years and years and years and years. And it's impossible, nearly impossible to shake a bad reputation. So, so I would genuinely encourage every single person, every lawyer who practices to think of their reputation and to think about the necessity of professionalism and civility in the practice of law. Because you can be adversaries with someone, absolutely. But you can also be civil and also be professional with them. I'll, I'll, I'll close this section with this. Some of my best friends are plaintiff lawyers, lawyers I've tried cases against, lawyers that I've paid money to in settlement, lawyers that, that we've argued at a deposition, but we've always been professional, we've always been courteous, and we've always respected one another. That's a critical piece. As a young lawyer, as an associate, your reputation is something that is developing and it's something you need to keep track of very, very attentively. All right, how to be an all-star at your office. Got to hydrate, that's important. There's tip number one, hydrate. All right, in your office, in, in your little castle, right? Where you go to do your work. Remember, there are clients all over that office, the other lawyers that have work coming in from external clients who are then assigning you work, who are asking you for help, who are asking you, hey, will you please make me look good to my clients? How do we do this? I want you all to think about becoming an expert on, on something in your firm. I, I don't care what it is. I want you to pick a thing and be the firm's expert on that thing. Caveat, it should be useful, right? Choose something that's marginal. Now, the lady that's got the two recorders playing, that might be that might be the thing. I don't know. I'm just saying. You got to be strategic in your decision making. But if you can pull out two recorders and blow them like that, that's that's that, that'll impress me. Um, technology was my thing, and and I understand. I, I feel like I'm dating myself. I came up as a young associate in the late '90s and early 2000s when technology wasn't a thing. When we didn't have email, we didn't have e-filing. Uh, when even changing the font was, you, I mean, this, I feel like I'm dating myself, but like, we didn't even have computers on our desk. We dictated everything. So technology was a big thing as it was coming into play. I, I will offer this without good evidence. So maybe this is wrong, but I think it's true. And I tell them, I think I was the first lawyer to try a case with PowerPoint in the state of Michigan. It was in 2000 uh, and it was a good case. And we used PowerPoint instead of flip charts. And it revolutionized things because we could change things on the fly. That made me intensely valuable to, to my boss, to my mentor, because I could show them a thing that they didn't know how to do. That became my piece of expertise. Now, my guess is, theoretically, everyone should be competent. There's actually a model rule of professional uh, conduct that, that requires you that if you're going to use a piece of technology, you should be competent with it. But that was my thing when it when it was really important. I, I want you to find a thing that is that is something on which you can be an expert. Here's a corollary to that. You should be the absolute expert on every one of your files. Now, now this piece, that's a thing that transcends all files. Maybe you maybe you're the firm's expert on on HIPAA law. Maybe you're the firm's expert on um, you know, serious impairment law. Maybe you become your firm's expert on how to get a meeting with a doc that doesn't want a meeting. Maybe you become an expert on a certain type of fastener in construction law. I don't know what it is, but every file that you're on, you should be the absolute expert in that file. No one, not even the, the, the partner who that file was assigned to should know that file better than you. You should know the facts. You should know the applicable law. You should know the players. You should know the scheduling order. You should know the judge, everything about that, because guess what? When there comes a question about the file, they're going to go to you. You're going to be the go-to person on that. 
the first case I ever took to trial, I was actually still a law clerk. It was a dental malpractice case, oral maxillofacial surgery uh, malpractice case uh, that came into our office three weeks before trial because the other lawyer was unable to try it. And there were thousands, hundreds, uh, maybe tens of thousands of pages of medical records. No one else wanted the job. It was assigned to me as a law clerk to know those records cold, so on and so forth. They took me to trial because I was the only one that knew those records. I, I got to be an expert on, on this, this person's health history and what happened before and what happened during the events edition, what happened afterwards. I sat in on expert witness meetings. I sat in all sorts of stuff. Opportunities come up like that all the time in the law. If you become an expert on your files, you will be brought into those files in a very meaningful and very proactive way. Own it. It's your file. Think of it as your file. Think of it as a thing that you're responsible for and know it. It's a pretty background. All right. I think this is funny. Look, look, here's the bottom line. If you could make your boss look good, that is great, right? There's a back and forth here. The, 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 the assigning partner, the, the one who has the origination, the one who's developed the client's trust over a career has the files. They need your help. They need to work on them. What do they need? They need to be meaningfully involved and you need to make them look good. Now, I, I guarantee you, no one is going to think at, 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 that, at that client's office, no one is going to think that your assigning partner sat down and did a, a phenomenal medical record summary on the medical records of the prior, you know, primary care physician. So, so they're going to know it was you, right? But you're making your boss look good. You're making your firm look good. You're building your own reputation, right? You show you know it, they're happy to give it. That's, that's the, the back and forth. That's, that's the implicit bargain here in, in this, this employment relationship. I think, and maybe it's even more than this, I think you should touch every file you have every week in a minimum. And I'm not saying that you should, you should gin up work to do that is not warranted, but I'll tell you what, if you leave a file sit cold for more than five days, something's happening, someone else is doing something, you're losing the opportunity to drive that file and to be proactive. Touch that file every week. Look at what the dates are. Think about what's coming up. Maybe you've got an expert deposition coming up three weeks from now. Shouldn't you be calling your deposition, your experts this week to ask them, hey, what should we be asking about you know, from, from this lady? Shouldn't you be working and coordinating, writing outlines, pulling the relevant details from the file to provide to the assigning partner? Maybe you're taking the deposition. Touch that file every week. Doesn't need to be long, but just stay aware, stay in tune. Stay ahead of your reporting. Good Lord, nobody likes reporting, right? I, I mean, I guess you can, with, with, with your reactions, you could raise your hand if you like reporting, uh, but I don't think anybody really likes reporting. It's, but here's the thing, it's how you're judged, not just by your boss, but by the clients on the receiving end, number one. Number two, it's important to them. They don't live the file every day. They don't touch it every week like you are, right? They live through your reporting. They live through your written word. And so when, you, when you're on top of your reporting, when you're complying with their guidelines, when you give them a deposition summary, if it's due 14 days from the date of the deposition and you give it in five, you're being judged positively for that level of effort. Now, here's the other piece. You're probably, as an associate, you're not going to be trying a case. Maybe you're going to be sitting second chair. That's great. Maybe you're not going to be taking the tough depositions, but you still have a chance to develop reputation by the quality of your reporting. Every report at the very end should, should have a little piece of attorney analysis. When you write that, as opposed to just vomiting and, and reciting facts as, as to what happened, you, you cease to become like a weather reporter and you become a forecaster. And that's a really critically important development in your career and in the health of the file. Because you're doing two things. Number one, you're telegraphing to the attorney who assigned that summary, who assigned that work. Hey, I know what this file is about. Here's the implication of this deposition. Here's how it helps us. Here's how it hurts us. Here's how it's neutral, whatever it might be. You're telegraphing as well to the clients, the end client, the out of firm client, who's going to read that summary and say, this is a bright lawyer who identified this issue and proactively took care of it, who, who said, oh, look, the doctor so-and-so testified that nurse so-and-so was off on the vitals. I forecasted that back in this summary right here. And I suggested we meet with nurse so-and-so and I met with nurse so-and-so. So I know what nurse so-and-so is going to say. That's how you develop reputation as being clever, as being thoughtful, as being hardworking, as being all the, all the adjectives, all the adjectives. Everybody organizes themselves differently. 
Um, I, I will say this, like I said before, I'm not your boss. There is no one way that works for everybody. All right. You have to find your own way of being organized and use it religiously. It, this is, I'm going to admit, this is stupid, but I, I do a lot of sticky notes. I, this whole wall is covered with sticky notes. And there's few things that satisfy me more than like ripping a sticky note off and crumpling it up and throwing it in the trash can. I've actually been migrating from sticky notes because we're doing some time in the office and some time at home to um, like electronic notes on a phone. But find a way to keep yourself organized and use it. That's the critical piece. Work it into your workflow until it becomes a habit of yours. Man, calendars are super, super important, right? Because due dates, they, they approach a lot faster. If you've got a witness list due date coming up, you better be writing that witness list a month ahead of time, or at least having notes on it so you don't forget, oh yeah, that like second damages witness that our client asked us to get. Oh, you don't forget that, that like weird eyewitness that might have seen something, might have not seen something. These due dates approach, the last thing you want to do is to be scrambling. Our clients will pay us to prepare these things mostly reasonably in advance. So have that, have that calendar, know what your due dates are, and, and work ahead of the, of, the, of the stream. And I say this, I mean, it used to be a nightmare. I, I remember there were some times when I was young in practice when we had a, a calendar, like an actual paper book, where I would wake in the middle of the night at 2 a.m., panicked. And I'd, I'd missed a summary judgment motion or I'd, I'd missed a witness list. I'd drive into the office and feverishly flip through the book. And then, then okay, no, it's next week. It's two weeks from now, whatever it might be. Now we have electronic calendars, so that's no big deal. Used to be you had to either send a thing in the mail with enough time for it to get to the judge or you had to physically drive and drop it off. Now it's all e-fine. So it's a little bit easier. Um, get to know your legal assistant, right? They're a power. They can be a, they can be a force of good or a force of... Uh, not good in your life. Um, if you make your legal assistant's life easier, they will make your life easier. And a lot of times, um, you know, your legal assistant is going to know more about the nuts and bolts of filing motions of what clerk will listen to you on the phone and whatnot than, than you will. They are an invaluable partner in the practice of law. They will, if you make their life easy, they will make you look good to the people you need to look good to. All right, let's talk about time a little bit. All of us defense attorneys see that clock and we see it divided into six minute segments, right? Oh, 0.1, 0.2, 0.3 right there. Who knows what it is? It's a myth to say that you have no time. There's always time. It's a question of prioritization. And that's the real issue. I, I don't mean to suggest that when you get stuff dumped on you from partner A and partner B and partner C and partner D and partner E all on the same day and it's all due tomorrow, that might be a legitimate piece where you have no time. But a lot of times, if you have a good workflow, you have a good relationship with your assigning attorneys, not having time is, is uh, synonymous, I suppose, or analogous to not having good organization. So having time, knowing how to use your time, that's the critical piece. Delmore Schwartz uh, has this great quote, and I, I'm sure a lot of you have heard this, time is the fire in which we burn. That's actually not the whole quote. The whole quote is time is the school in which we learn, time is the fire in which we burn. Because it goes both ways, right? Time is a critical piece, especially on the defense side of things where we're judged by every minute that we spend. It's important to learn and to master your time management. And I'll tell you this, organization is time. The more organized you are, the more time you will have to spend meaningful minutes on those files. And I do want to make a distinction. There are non-meaningful minutes that we all spend on our files. And there are also meaningful minutes. Those meaningful minutes are the minutes you spend writing that last paragraph of the summary, the, or, the, the analysis uh, piece. That's, that's important stuff. Um, I will show this later. I, I see that I'm, I'm running short on time. So I've only got 10 minutes. This graph right here could be an entire hour long presentation and I'll get to it in a second. So you've seen this, you've seen this. All right, let's talk about dollars and cents a little bit because we got to talk about dollars and cents, right? So when MDTC initially set, sent this out, they missed a, they, they put an additional comma. And I was supposed to talk about billing hygiene. And I would talk about billing comma, hygiene comma. And one of my clients actually reached out and said, hey, are you going to talk with a bunch of dirty lawyers about how to wash your hands? No, we're going to talk about billing hygiene. And here's an important piece. You as an associate, you're an engine for the firm. If you think about any business, you think about, Profit centers and cost centers. This is basic MBA 101. Cost centers are the things that you have to have, the items of structural overhead that cost money, that don't produce money. So an office manager, 
uh, a billing clerk, uh, legal assistants, uh, you know, copy machine, things like that. Profit centers are things that produce revenue, things that produce profit. You are a profit center, whether you know it or not, for your firm, potentially a profit center, maybe. So billing hygiene is really important. So, so let's look at this. Number one, bill for your work. Don't, don't give it away. This is not the Southern Poverty Law Center. Our clients hire us because they want us to do work. They want us to do work well. Bill for it, but bill contemporaneously. Don't save it up until the end of the month. That's a really, really bad habit to get into because I guarantee you, you're going to forget a whole bunch of point ones and point twos along the way. And if you forget a point two every single day, a phone call here, an email there, something like that, that's an hour at the end of the week. That's 50 hours in a year of just lost time, time that you've donated to big corporations. And maybe that's all right. Maybe you want to do that. Maybe you don't. I want to get paid for the work that I do. So I'm going to try to bill as closely as I can to contemporaneously. If I do something, I'm going to bill for it. Be fair to yourself and be fair to your firm, right? If you spend four hours on a motion to compel, and again, I'm not your boss, I'm not telling you what to do, but you should account for that in some fashion because if it took you four hours and it's usually an hour and a half process, I'm not really sure uh, what you'd be writing, um, account for that time somehow. Tell your supervisor, hey, look, this took me four hours. I, I, you know, I, I, I should, it shouldn't have taken that long, but it took me four hours. Maybe there's something they can do to get that billing put through. And just remember this, the clients want to pay you. They hired you to solve a problem. They hired you to take an issue off of their, off of their desks. They want to pay you for your time. So be fair on that. I'm going to blow through this fairly quickly because we're running short on time, just like I predicted. What's the most important equation in law firm management? It's not E equals MC squared. It's revenue minus expense equals profit. That is the basic formula by which a business exists. Revenue is money that comes in the door. Expense is money that goes out the door. Your salary, your health benefits, your bonus, your secretary's salary, uh, the copy machine, the carpet, the lights, all of that stuff. Hopefully, revenue is greater than expense, which means that there's profit. In the and that means that a business is doing well, that the partners can take home some money because that's how owners of a law firm get paid, that you can take home some money in terms of bonus, that everybody is happy then because everybody who has contributed to that, uh, it makes sense. And I'll offer this. It's not an evil thing, right? It, 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 this is why law firms exist because you want to get paid. You want to get paid. Your partner wants to get paid. The law firm wants to get paid. There's lots of families that are relying on that law firm for continued survival. So as a profit center, you want to accomplish what the goal of employment is, is to produce revenue for your firm. And you know, for you to get paid, for the firm to get paid, for everybody to get paid. That's a good thing. It's not a dirty thing. It's not a secret thing. It's, a, it's an important thing. I'll offer this. Anybody who's seen Encanto, like I have with kids about 400,000 times, is hearing this song in their head right now. The rats along is back. Um, we don't want to talk about billing. You know what your expectations are. If it's if it's 1,800 hours, if it's 2,000 hours, if it's 1,600, you know what that expectation is. The last thing you want to talk about when you come into a salary review or an end of year bonus review is your numbers. Right. You don't you don't want to have to offer explanations about, oh, well, you know, I was boy, I was shooting for 160 hours a month and I only got 120 hours a month. I mean, that especially at the end of the year, you should you should know that way in advance. It's the elephant in the room. Believe you me, as firm managers, we know who's getting the hours down and who's not. That's something that you should proactively be bringing. If you're not hitting your weekly target, whatever that target might be, it's time to sit down with your mentor. It's time to sit down with the attorney who's assigning you work and ask, hey, what am I missing? Like, how, how can I get this? How do I bill X? They're going to know. A lot of clients have billing guidelines. You should know those guidelines and you should follow them because there are things that you cannot bill for. There are also a lot of things that you can bill for. You should know how to do what your clients have asked you to do. And billing is an art. And like any good art, art takes time. Um, all right. So some other stuff. This is the last section. So we're going to close this out. And I'm gonna, I apologize for running late. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff here that we've talked about. This is a big sandwich with a lot of big bites. You got time management, skill development, initiatives, stress, fulfilling deadlines, accurate and fair billing, client services, courtroom etiquette. The reality is this, the, the true consequence of being good at your work is that you get more of it, right? Some people view that as a negative. I'll tell you this. I think a lot of us went into the law because we want to do more work. We want to have more clients. We want to have more responsibility. We want to do the bigger, juicier, more important things. That takes time to build up that reputation. 
So don't think of this as a bad thing. Think of this as a good thing. Now, that being said, you want to find the balance. The, 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 the busier folks in a law firm are often the more competent ones in a law firm, the ones who have found that balance, who have found the way of, of accomplishing the goals of their in-firm clients and their out-of-firm clients. That requires a balancing act. It, 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 there are only so many hours in a day to do things. You have to find that organization. Don't get overloaded. Be really careful. It's not going to work out for anybody involved. I guarantee that. By the way, that is a, a, a Blackberry, in case any of you are wondering. That used to be like state-of-the-art technology. Uh, and that's a delicious hamburger. That's not me, by the way. That is not me. Um, if you get overloaded, you're not doing yourself a favor. You're not doing anybody a favor. So you want to make sure that you have enough work to keep you occupied and enough work to keep you busy, but you're not drowning in it. And if you find yourself drowning, never be afraid to approach whoever your supervisor is and say, look, I, I've got so many things. I don't know which way is up. I need help. Ask for help because I guarantee you this. They want you to succeed. They need you to succeed. It's important that you're successful. And being overloaded and constantly scrambling is not good for anybody. I, you'll be able to work out a plan. This is the thing that I had. If you look up Stephen Covey's uh, time management quadrants, you can learn more about this. I, I'll tell you what, though, this grid right here, maybe a whole other hour presentation. It's important. Play the part, right? Uh, you know, you're, you're getting hired for folks. Maybe dress up a little bit. I've seen lawyers on Zoom depositions wearing T-shirts with the raggedy neck and so on and so forth. I'm not saying you got to wear a tie all the time, but, but dress up a little bit. You know, play the part. Because uh, perception is reality. That's rule number one at trial. Perception is reality. Uh, read books, and I'll offer you this. I, you know, you could read all the reptile books in the world, and then do a, you know clever presentations on on what you learned about the triune brain and all this nonsense and the tentacles of danger. And then you could Photoshop yourself into pictures of you killing snakes because clients years ago wanted to hear about the reptile theory. But you know, you read other books. Read books that you find interesting. I got you know, there's a couple right here. There's one on like mouse utopia, there's the death of expertise. People are interested in things that are interesting. And if you know stuff about stuff, don't, don't hesitate to share it. Do something that makes you happy. Maybe it's Photoshopping, you know, Velociraptors. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but, you know, share a little bit. Um, there's a thing called the Facebook. Some of you may know about the Facebook. I'm on the Facebook. Um, it's controversial in my firm. I, I'm friends with a ton of my clients, both institutional clients and individual physicians, so on and so forth. And I've been criticized for that. Ah, why do you want to share your life? Why do you want to overshare so on and so forth? I'll tell you what, it makes you three-dimensional. It reminds your bosses that you're a human being and it reminds your clients that you're a human. I, I post a bunch of pictures of my kids knowing that my clients will see them and knowing that if they want to yank all my files for whatever reason, uh, they're going to, you know, they're going to lose the guy that, that has ranch dressing soda or like, I got all these kids, you're going to put them on the street. Really? You know, something along those lines. It's important. It connects you as a human being. It more, more than that, it gives you something to talk about. Dale Carnegie was famous for say, for saying to be interesting, be interested. It's a two-way street. Ask your client, Hey, you know, what are your hobbies? What do you do? How do you do it? Why do you do that? So on and so forth. This is, uh, look, this is a lot. I know it's, it's a lot. It's all about balance. But here's, here's the quote, and here it comes, what you could have learned from The Rock. Dwayne The Rock Johnson said this, and it stuck with me for a, a long time. Be humble, be hungry, and always be the hardest worker in the room. If you, if you don't listen to anything else that I said, maybe about the swine apple, and you just listen to Dwayne The Rock Johnson with that, you're going to be very successful in your career. Because that is a recipe for a lot of success, is, is hard work, is dedication, is humility, and is just getting the job done as the job requires, making the folks that send you work look good, and in turn, they'll make you look good, and that's how everybody gets happy. That's all I got. I Like I said, I knew I was going to go right to one o'clock. I apologize for rushing this. If any of you have, uh, have questions, um, you know, you should know how to get a hold of me. I'm in the, I'm in the bar journal. Um, it's spelled J-U-I-P, which is controversial. Um, but you can also pop them up in the uh, question and answer. I'd be happy to answer them. I'd be happy to chat afterwards for as long as is needed. Uh, thank you for attending. Thank you for listening to this. Uh, I wish you all great success in your careers. And I hope that um, I hope that I've said something today that is at least marginally interesting to you. Uh, that's the presentation. Last piece, join MDTC.
It's a good organization. I like it. Uh, Madeline, did we have anything to close out with? No, you did an excellent job, Randy. Thank you. All right. Uh, I don't see any questions popping up. So we have 12 people still on the call and I don't see any questions either. Yeah. Maybe they're all enjoying their lunch. They should be. <laughs> oh, wait, we've got one. Oh, here we go. All right, Angela, thank you for the tip on the swine apple. Look, that's like the best tip. I, you know, I don't want to sell all the tips short, but like it, it really is quite delicious. If you try it, you can even do it on a Weber grill. You do it on indirect heat, set your fire on one side, set the swine apple on the other, just let it hang out there. It's really more of a summer treat. Obviously, a guy with my BMI has a lot of good pork based grilling tips. So, all right. I kind of feel well, that's it, Madeline. Thank you, Randy. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you, MDTC.